Well, good morning, everyone. Good rainy morning, I should say. Looks like we have rain for today. But I understand Sunday is going to be very sunny. So I'd like to say we'll see you at our worship and ministry center. But we'll see you online on Sunday morning. Um, let me just share a couple of things as you're turning in your Bibles again to Philippians chapter 3. Um, <clears throat> I've had to get on Facebook, of course, because of doing these uh, devotional times. <clears throat> and uh, to be honest, I never really had entered into the world of Facebook before. But uh, about a week and a half ago, I, I got a message from someone, um, because I'm on Facebook now, someone who I had not seen in over 40 years. Um, it was kind of a high school friend. And I learned from this high school friend that uh, she is now uh, a believer in the Lord, and I can remember witnessing to her. I actually remember taking her to see and hear Billy Graham, uh, I think in 1978 at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. And um, I had prayed for her and thought about her over the years. And uh, now I, I know that she's a follower of the Lord. So we're kind of engaging in a Facebook conversation now. And so that's a pretty exciting thing for me. And I'm really praising God because that has certainly lifted my spirits during this COVID lockdown that we're all experiencing. Uh, just a reminder again that tomorrow uh, we won't be in Philippians, but we'll be uh, looking at the topic of grieving. And Andrea is going to join me for that. And we're going to look at a number of passages in God's word and just, just kind of talk about our feelings um, and the things that we are grieving about today. If you have any questions about death and grieving, uh, loss, things of that nature, feel free to send them in today. Perhaps we can answer them tomorrow, but I will need to get them today. Well, uh, let's pray now and look to the Lord and ask him for, for his help. Uh, Lord, we're grateful that we can begin again this day, uh, as we have done previous days, looking into your word, um, coming to you, the bread of life, coming to your word, which is food to our souls, and to ask you for the sustenance that we need. Give us this day, we pray, our daily bread. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us. We pray that our minds and hearts and ears would be open and receptive to whatever truth you want to reinforce into our hearts and minds. So we ask again for the help of the Holy Spirit in doing all this, because, Lord, we want to know you more. Please assist us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as I said yesterday, um, our focus this morning is just going to be two verses, uh, verses 10 and 11 of Philippians chapter 3. But I want to go back uh, and start reading um, at verse 7. You remember in the first um, six verses, the Apostle Paul talks about this confidence that he had in the flesh. Um, all the things that he was trusting in about his personal achievement and the things that he had inherited through his family line, all of these were personal spiritual advantages, or so he thought to him. But he lays all those aside and he finds his confidence now in the Lord Jesus Christ. So beginning then at verse 7, he talks about this change, this transformation that happened in him. He writes, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, garbage, he says, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Here's the two key verses now. Here's how he concludes this. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. This is God's holy word. Thanks be to God. 
Well, let me make a number of comments. As I already mentioned, um, we talked yesterday about these seven advantages that Paul saw that he had if, if he was placing confidence in his flesh. And uh, it's interesting that the number is seven because we know that in the Bible, seven is the number of perfect, perfection. So Paul, in essence, is saying, look, I, I can add all these things up and I'm, I'm perfect. But when he adds them all up, he says, it's zero, it's nothing. It is absolute loss. Um, and he then says that what is more important is that I have Christ in my ledger, not, not all of these things that I can boast about. And uh, so Jesus is not just the number of perfect perfection, he is perfection itself. So there's this contrast then between confidence in the flesh and confidence or boasting in Christ. And he concludes that this passage with this expression of desire to know Christ. So yesterday I concluded with just saying that our greatest need as believers is to know Christ and this should be also our greatest desire to know him. So let me make just a couple of general observations about verses 7 through 11. And the first is uh, the word or the name Christ uh, is found here in this passage, either the word Christ or a pronoun uh, concerning him, about him, nine times, nine times. So so the, the whole passage here is, is Christ centered. Secondly, the, the dominant thought here is about knowing Jesus. In verse 8, he, he talks about the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And, and that's really the theme here. He, he's developing this theme of not only do I know him, but I want to know him even, even more. The other thing is, particularly in verses 10 and 11, there, he flips back and forth between death and resurrection. The cross, the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. The fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. There's the death of the Lord Jesus. Becoming like him in his death. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. So death and resurrection are really the the dominant ideas. The other thing I would say, uh, by way of a general observation, is that this passage is, is really telling us what Paul's goal in life was. Um, this was like his, his life verse. His personal goal in life was to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I want to do now is I just want to take these two verses and we'll just take it phrase by phrase. And let me make some Comments. So the first phrase is, I want to know Christ. The first part of verse 10. I want to know Christ. When Paul wrote these words, it was actually 30 years after his experience on the Damascus Road when Jesus apprehended him and Paul surrendered to his lordship. 30 years. So Paul has known the Lord now for a, a considerable amount of time. But he's saying here, I want to know Christ even more. So again, we see clearly in verse 10 that this plea to know Christ is not a plea to be saved. Rather, it is the plea of those who are saved. It is a plea, a longing to know the Lord more. An ever-deepening, ever-widening personal knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing we want to ask ourselves, it's always important to ask a question while you're doing your devotion, devotions. A statement is made. The first question you need to ask here is, well, how? How? How can I know Christ even more? And um, throughout my whole Chris Christian life, there's just been a number of words that I have always kept in mind. Um, I call them the means of grace. It's not a, a term that I, um, a phrase that I made up myself. The, this term, the means of grace, has been used by Bible teachers for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And what we mean by that is there are certain things that God has placed before us, given to us. They're a means by which we can grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And those words are the Bible, prayer, worship, fellowship, witness. Um, by Bible reading, by praying, by fellowship, by worship, by witnessing about Christ, we, we grow in him and we, we get to know him more. So we need to be people of prayer. Uh, prayer shouldn't just be something that kind of gets done just before a meal. We should begin our day in prayer. We should close our day in prayer. We should pray throughout the day. Paul talked about praying without ceasing. We need to be constantly looking to the Lord. As we pray, as we commune with him in prayer, we get to know him more. Reading God's word, of course. Um, we see Jesus is here in the Bible. The Bible is totally about him. So we need his word. Worshiping the Lord where the scriptures are taught. I would go even further and say there are other books about uh, the gospel and about God's word that we should be reading. One book that I have found very, very helpful is uh, by the author Philip Yancey, The Jesus I Never Knew. I recommend that book to you. I commend it to you because he just takes you right into the, the, gos the gospels and gives an overview of the life of Christ that, that is very, very enriching to uh, the soul. And then there's fellowship with other believe believers. You know, we, we need to be we need to be placing around us, surrounding ourselves with those who really love the Lord with all their hearts, because it is in them that we see Jesus, and frankly, we get to know Jesus more in them. There's so much that I could say on that. I, I, I think about my aunt and uncle who led me to Christ. I think my mother about my mother-in-law who just passed away uh, a couple of weeks back. Um, it was a joy to be in their presence. Um, Donna Carson um, mentions this in his commentary. And uh, he says, look around for those whose constant confidence is Jesus Christ, whose constant boast is Jesus Christ whose constant delight is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the center of their worship. He is the center of their gratitude, the center of their love, the center of their hope. Emulate those whose constant confidence and boast is in Christ Jesus and nothing else. So I think these are some practical ways in which we can know Christ more. But the answer the answer to how we know Christ more is also found in these verses that we're looking at here. So we've, we've dealt with the first phrase, I want to know Christ. Now let's take a peek at the second phrase. And the second phrase is, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. So I, I'm, I'm going to take these two together because they really are closely linked. You can't, you can't separate these. Um, these are two principles the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. They're two principles that in some way interpret each other. Let's talk about his resurrection power first. Um, when you read a phrase like this, the power of his resurrection, it's, it's always good to go back uh, to read the resurrection accounts. Go back to the Gospels, go back to the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, the Peter, uh, the sermon that Peter preached at, at at, at Pentecost is predominantly about the resurrection. And so just go back and read those again, because that, that refreshes your mind about what Paul means by the power of the resurrection. Jesus, according to the gospel accounts, he really died. Uh, he didn't just enter into a coma. Um, he, he, he wasn't resuscitated. He literally rose again from the dead. He, his body, his resurrected body, passed effortlessly through the the um, uh, the wrappings that they had placed around around him, uh, and 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 those wrappings were were just left there in the tomb as though he had discarded a cocoon that he was in for a period of a time. In Romans chapter one verse five, Paul says that Jesus was declared with power to be the son of God through his resurrection from the dead. It's interesting because all through the Bible, particularly in the book of Acts, it says, and God raised him from the dead. But you go to John chapter two and Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. So God raised him up. 
But in John 2, Jesus says, I raised myself up. And you go to Romans 8, and there Paul says, he refers to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. So we see that in the resurrection, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all involved. The Trinity, the power of our triune God, raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And this power, according to Ephesians 1, verse 19 and 20, is given to us who believe. The power of the resurrection is given to us who believe. It's given to sustain the new life that we have received when we put our faith and trust in the Lord, the Lord Jesus. And so even our conversion to Christ is described as a resurrection. You go to Ephesians chapter 2, and there the Apostle Paul says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God in his mercy made us alive with Christ. He gave us his life. He raised us up, and he seated us in the heavenly places in, in, in Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, the Apostle Paul again likens our conversion to the power of God at creation. He says, for God who let his light shine in the, dark, the, dark, the darkness, the God who said, let there be light, has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So um, again, the resurrection power, the power of creation, uh, has been given to us. It's all a part of, of, of this conversion that we have when we put our faith in Christ. And Paul experienced this, of course, and he talks about it here, when he was transformed from being a person who put his confidence in the flesh to now being an individual who put his confidence in Christ. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, we are new creations. If anyone is in Christ, he, she is a new creation. And this is the way that Paul lived. He lived with this resurrection power. And there's a very interesting passage in, in 2 Corinthians 4 where, where Paul talks about um, many of the struggles that he had. And he writes these words in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Um, perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. And this is the one I like. Struck down, but not destroyed. Eugene Peterson, in his, his uh, paraphrase of this passage, uh, uh, writes that we are squeezed, but not squashed. We are bewildered, but not befuddled. We are pursued, but not abandoned. We are knocked down, but we are not knocked out. Why is that so? because of the power of the resurrection. And the sign that we know Christ is that we're experiencing this power on a daily basis. So Paul also had an expectation of a future resurrection. He makes mention of that at the end of chapter three, where he talks about uh, waiting for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly or our mortal, perishable bodies so that they would be like his glorious body. So the, the whole of the Christian life from beginning to end and to resurrection is, is all put in terms of the power of the resurrection. So do, do you want to know this power? Do I want to know this power? Do, do we long for it? And we should be praying that we will experience it. But it's tied in with the next phrase, which is the fellowship of his sufferings, or of, of sharing in uh, the sufferings of Christ. And the English Standard Version, version just simply says, share in his sufferings. It's the same word, it's the word fellowship. So, so suffering for Christ goes hand in hand with the power of the resurrection. It's like Good Friday and Easter. You really, you really can't separate the two. You can't, you can't separate the death of Christ from the resurrection. If he only died, we don't have hope. If he, so, so you have to have both. They're linked to each other. And again, in these verses, we see references to the cross, to death, and to the resurrection. So these two, power, the power of his resurrection, and suffering for, for him, 
are, are linked. And frankly, the power of the resurrection enables us. It's what we need um, in order to suffer. And we need both in order to know the Lord Jesus even more. Now, fellowship is a recurring word here in this book. We go back to chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul talks about our fellowship in the gospel. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7, he says, we share together, that is fellowship together in God's grace. Uh, in chapter 2, verse uh, 1, he talks about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So when we when we read these words, we kind of go, yeah, yeah, that's that's the fellowship I want. I, I, I want more of that. I, I want to pray for that. I want to be united together with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to share in God's grace. And I, I certainly want to... Um, I want to know this power and this fellowship with each other. I want a fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But are we as eager to pray and ask God for the fellowship of his sufferings? Are we? And that's a real challenge. But friends, suffering is essential to knowing Christ. According to Paul here, suffering is essential to knowing Christ in the fullness of of what Paul is experiencing here in these verses. Here's a fact. I'll give you a few, a few facts, but, but, but the first fact is that suffering is, not maybe, not possibly, but suffering is the experience of every true believer in Jesus. The apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 14, he went back to encourage the churches that he had um, established and he went back to them and he, he encouraged them. And he said, through much tribulation, we enter the kingdom of God. And we've already seen here in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. It has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. So just as faith is a gift of God's grace to us, so suffering is a gift of God's grace to us. You and I are the beneficiaries of his sufferings. But we should also be the sharers of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember this. Suffering is not a sign of God's neglect. Rather, it is proof of God's grace that is at work in our lives. Here's another fact. The more we become like Christ, the more we suffer. And the more we suffer, the more we become like Christ. Let me say that again. The more we become like Christ, the more we suffer. And the more we suffer, the more we become like Christ. And it is in suffering for the Lord Jesus that we are actually enabled to experience the power of the resurrection. Um, here's a passage that I think is probably familiar to to, to, most, to most of us. You remember that passage in 2 Corinthians 12 where, where Paul talks about this thorn in the flesh that was given to him? And he didn't like it, and he asked the Lord three times if the Lord would remove it from, from him. We don't know exactly what that thorn was. It was suffering in some kind of way. But he asked if the Lord would take it away. But Jesus answered him and said, my grace is sufficient for you for my power, there's that word again, my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul then said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. So do we want this? Do we want to share in the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ? This is something we're asking God for. You know, there are things we should be asking God for that we don't really want. It reminds me of a story that I heard many years ago of a, a young man who came to his pastor and he said to him, Pastor, I am so impatient. I struggle with patience. Would you pray that God would make me a patient person? And so the pastor bowed his head and he began to pray, Lord, Please bring all kinds of suffering and tribulation into this young man's life. Oh, Lord, bring more tribulation into his life. And, and the young man said, Pastor, no, no, no. That's not what I'm asking you to pray for. But the pastor reminded the young, the young man, it is tribulation that produces patience. 
And so there are some things we don't really want to ask God for. But if we want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and experience the power of the resurrection, then we need to be asking God for these things and preparing our hearts for them as well. Well, the next two phrases, Paul goes on and the next phrase is becoming like him in his death, literally being conformed uh, to his death. And this phrase reminds me of Jesus' words. Remember where he said, if anyone wants to follow me, he must take up his cross. He has to deny himself and follow me. Um, so what was Jesus like in his death? Well, Paul's already given us a, a picture of that in Philippians 2, that he humbled himself. He became obedient to death. He was obedient. He was humble. Uh, he became a servant. Isaiah 53 is a passage that the Apostle Peter quotes in his letter. And uh, he points out that, that he was like a sheep that was led to the slaughter. He, he did not open his mouth. He, he accepted suffering. He accepted death um, to be conformed into the likeness of his death is what Paul is writing about here. He was self, selfless. And, and Peter goes on to say that on the cross, you remember, they hurled insults at him, but Jesus did not retaliate. He, he was godly. He was holy in his response. And there is a sense in which Paul is saying concerning himself that there were personal crosses that he bore, but they produced a series of mini resurrections in his life. And they take us into a deeper knowledge of the Lord Jesus. The last phrase, to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now it almost sounds in this passage, he says somehow to attain. It almost sounds as though he's uncertain about the, res the resurrection here. Um, I like the way the ESV reads because the ESV says that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection. So, so for Paul, he saw the resurrection as certain. There, he didn't have any doubts about it. But what he wasn't certain of was what would be the intervening events? What would be the timing and the circumstances that would lead to this? That's what he was really uncertain about. Would he, would he die now and and go to be with Christ and then later rise at the resurrection? Or would he be here on the earth when, when Christ came, comes back? Where, in a sense, at the resurrection time, we are, we are transformed. We're caught up together uh, with those uh, who have died before us. Uh, no resurrection in the sense of death first, but just there's going to be a generation of believers who will be on the earth when Jesus comes. You see, these are the things that Paul was uncertain of as it pertained to himself. But what he did know is that he would rise and that he would receive a resurrection body. But for Paul, the, the great prize wasn't even the resurrection. The great prize was Christ. It was knowing Christ. So let me try to conclude and to summarize verse 10 and 11 for us here. And, and I'm paraphrasing now from Kent Hughes. Uh, Kent Hughes does a, a wonderful job of this, taking this, this whole passage and summarizing it and here's what he says. And again, these are in my own words, but I'm paraphrasing his thoughts. When Paul was converted, he received the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He cast away, he renounced all of his confidence in the flesh. Knowing Jesus became his passion. It became his daily pursuit. Paul set his heart and his mind on learning everything he could about the Lord Jesus Christ. He read the Old Testament writings, and we see this in Paul's writings because he makes reference to the Old Testament over and over and over again because Paul discovered Jesus in those Old Testament writings. He went down into Arabia for a period of time where he grew in his knowledge of knowing Christ. He met the apostles. He was surrounded by them, by those who were the eyewitnesses of the Lord. He had Luke on his apostolic church planting team, the one who wrote the gospel of Luke. And he learned more about Jesus from the gospel writer Luke. Every day was a resurrection day for the apostle Paul. He sought the power of the resurrection on a daily basis. And that enabled Paul to share 
in the privilege of suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ. And those sufferings increased his intimacy with Jesus. This meant that every day Paul was being conformed to the death of Christ. Paul's life was being stamped with the imprint of the cross and a growing knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And this meant that Paul looked with confidence to the day of resurrection when a full knowledge of Christ will be grasped and all of creation will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. Now, this is all stated by Paul in a nutshell in verse 10 and 11. And this is what we should want. This is what we should be praying for. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, this is a challenging passage. The Apostle Paul is always a challenge to us. The things that he says, the, the passion, the example that he set for us. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. And we want to be like the Lord Jesus. And so we want to take to heart Paul's words. And Lord, all of us who know you, we can say sincerely that yes, this is what we want to. We want to know Christ. We want to know the power of his resurrection. And even reluctantly in our hearts, Lord, we still say yes and even sharing in the fellowship of suffering because we want our lives to be conformed. We want to become like him in his death. We want to die to self. We don't want to have any more confidence in the flesh. We want our lives to be filled with the glory of the Lord Jesus, with the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. We want to be more and more intimate with him. And so we pray today, Lord, that you would make this a reality in all of our lives, that you would use even the circumstances that we're going through now, you would drive us deeper into your word and into prayer and into suffering and an experience of your power because we want to be like you, Lord. And we look forward to that great day of resurrection when we will see you as you are and we will be like you. And Lord, we pray that you will speed that day. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining me here today. It looks like I've uh, gone a little longer than I, I anticipated. Sorry about that. Welcome to Sunday morning. And um, I hope you'll come and join Andrea and I uh, here uh, tomorrow as we talk about grieving. God bless you all.